As long as I can remember, I've been exposed to both the arts and the healthcare worlds. When I grew up, I learned about illness, surgery, recovery, the challenges of working in the healthcare system at the dinner table when everybody was home from work. My mom had early mornings in the sur doing surgery, the operating room, going to rounds, and my dad had late nights working in his research lab and trying to get to that next grant deadline. And I'm also remarkably privileged to have had quite a number, not only in my nuclear family, but in my extended family and chosen family, folks who worked in healthcare, who were in public health, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, nursing. And so from a very early age, I had this understanding that people from all walks of life, no matter where you're from, at some point will have some kind of interaction with the healthcare system. And also that the folks who are working there every single day to make it run, they're just people. They're people, they have hopes, they have fears, they have frustrations, they have fulfilling moments, and it's just a part of life. I also was remarkably privileged in my youth to have exposure to a lot of enrichment arts activities and opportunities. My siblings and I learned musical instruments from a young age. I played in orchestra, sang in choirs. We went to the theater, we went to the ballet, we went to galleries. So I do think this immense privilege also was a foot into understanding kind of the art world and its traditions and really appreciating it because it's something that my family really appreciated. Here are just some natural examples of medical artifacts e kind of easing their way or like making their way sideways into my artistic practice. Back in 2017, I was working on a portrait series and those are just photos from me in the studio using old scrubs as well as surgical drapes to cover my clothing. And sometimes there would be objects, things from the lab or from the hospital that were being thrown out or discontinued that I found to be quite beautiful, such as these vials in the bottom left. So I also made a number of pieces with those objects, those found objects as they made their way to me. My first full-time job after hospital, after high school was quartering at a hospital at the Royal Alec Hospital in Edmonton. And quartering is a really interesting job because what you do is you run around. You go get patients, help them onto stretchers, you transfer them to another part of the hospital, you change over, you clean it, you change the sheets, you grab another patient, you move them somewhere else. There's medical samples that you take to the lab. And so it's a pretty amazing opportunity to sort of be a fly on the wall in these environments because you aren't burdened with the direct responsibility of providing care to the patients. So I paid a lot of attention to the environment itself. On the right hand side, you can see this garden in an atrium. It was one of my favorite spaces. It had a great effect on my nude. And I saw a lot of other people who liked to visit it as well. And just the human interactions. And of course, because I was always thinking about art and making art, the art that was in the hospital that I worked at really stood out to me as well. And I thought a lot about it. Here's some examples of some of my favorite pieces. I took these photos back in 2011 when I was working there. Some of them are still in the hospital, some aren't. This is Chris Cran, hand number three. It was a loan from the Alberta Foundation for the Arts. And what I really loved about this piece, not only did it have this kind of striking image and texture when you walked up to it, but in a way it was kind of an object of wayfinding because it was this inviting hand almost saying to folks who use stairs, hey, come this way. There were also some very beautiful portraits. These are by Violet Owen. One of them is still there, the other is gone, but I just love them as a pair. And just seeing those colors and those faces as I went up the staircase that they were placed on always sparked a little bit of joy, even when it was a rough day. This is one of my absolute favorite series that I got to walk by. And it wasn't very often because I worked in the Royal Alex Hospital and there's a newer hospital that's adjacent, it's attached called the Lois Hole Hospital for Women that was built in 2010. So it was a lot newer and there had been a lot more recent attention put into 
the lighting and the decor and the, you know, the whole, it was just newly built and designed. And so it was sort of a treat when I got to spend time in that space and walk through that space. These images in the hallway are from a series by Steven Sorba. They were donated corporate donations from Epcor and Enbridge. And the series is called The Art of Hope, Energy and Survival. And they're high quality prints of a painting series he did related to his experience surviving and going through cancer treatment. But it wasn't just the official art on the walls that I noticed. I also really appreciated the little moments of creativity and humanity that sometimes snuck their way into the wards. Like this, Unit 44, some staff member had drawn all these Mr. and Mrs. characters with the bird, and it was just joyful to look at. And you can still see it was being functionally used as a whiteboard. You see those transfers, discharges, and post-ops, but there was a little bit of extra space, and they took advantage of that to make some beauty. There was also a poetry series by Gerald St. Maurer and Christine Van Eyck, the petal suites that were a combination of sketching and drawing. So there was lots to look at every time I went by. Sometimes I would read, sometimes I would look. And another thing I noticed besides the art were really the people. People think of hospitals separate from the rest of society. They think of them as their own self-contained bubbles, but they're full of people. That's all they are, but they're people running the system, they're people receiving care. And inside of all these people is just this vast wealth of different experiences and origin stories. And I noticed, I was just, I was really young and I'd just go down to the basement at the beginning of my shift. I'd strip down, I'd take off my street clothes, the clothing that I used to identify as myself. I'd put my scrubs on put my badge on, come back upstairs, and suddenly people looked at me as though I belonged there, as though I knew about the space, I would be able to help direct them. Of course, I'd tell them, go to the hand painting, turn left. And it's a funny thing. Pam Hall, who's a social practice artist based in Newfoundland, did a residency at Memorial University in their medical school in the late 90s. And she did this project called Making Introductions. She took inspiration from the process now we use electronic medical records, but at the time, doctors would go and they'd take a history with a clipboard. And she wanted to take that same practice and take a sort of experiential or emotional or identity type of a history rather than looking at their bodies like a doctor would do with a patient. So she took three images and she did this with a number of physicians, but also other kinds of nurses and other kinds of staff in the hospital. She took a photo of them in their regular street clothes a photo of them in their work uniform, and then a photo of them in a patient's gown or a Johnny coat as they call them, that open back gown. And then she would ask them a series of questions about their experiences. Because even if you're a doctor, you get sick sometimes, you need surgery. So they had all had these experiences of receiving care and what it felt like to be in that gown versus being in their street clothes and how that made them feel. And often there is that stripping down of identity, especially for staff, but that's functional. You're doing your job. People need to know what your job is um, and what you're doing there. But when it comes to being a patient, when you go into that patient's gown, then you put the wristband on, there really is this real transformation that happens from you being you to you being a recipient of care and that power dynamic that comes with it. So I thought of it a little bit like ink. If you look at black or blue ink, you just see the one color. And that's what happens a little bit with uniforms. And it, again, it's functional. You have to read the writing of that pen, right? But if you look inside of it, there's so much more that people have to offer. And sometimes my colors inside or my you know, personality was a little bit of a challenge working in this environment. It's very hierarchical, it's very systematic, it's very efficient, and that's awesome because it needs to be. We are saving lives, we are doing very important work, risky procedures sometimes. But on the other hand, I saw just witnessing a lot of red tape when it came to creative problem solving and thinking a little bit outside of the box. And I think definitely a part of it is just a challenge with resource availability and burnout. But I had a couple of experiences. One example is when I would take patients from upstairs to downstairs where they were going to be getting their surgery, there was this long hallway before you got to the OR. 
And a lot of them, when I'd come and I say, it's time for us to go, they'd say, no, 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 folks that could walk, they'd want to walk. They'd say, no, 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 I can walk. This is silly. But it was procedure and there were good reasons that we had to take them on the stretcher. And so already they're out of their equilibrium. It's a scary experience going into surgery. And then they were there flat on their backs in an unusual position. And they had to look at these blank white ceiling tiles while they were going through this whole emotional experience. And one time I commented, well, wouldn't it be cool if there was something hanging there, a mural on the ceiling tiles, something that would just provide a little bit of beauty and distraction for folks right before they go into surgery. And I commented, and I remember just the whole attitude of people hearing that was shut up and sit down. That's the silliest idea that would never happen. Infection control, this and that, that's just dumb. And <laughs> another time we had this whiteboard in the block room, which is sort of the nursing station where porters, we'd be there with the anesthesiologists and nursing staff. And then we'd stay there too. And portering has a lot of waves of work especially when you were working in day surgery as I was, because there's this rush in the morning when everybody's getting to the operating theaters. Then there's a little quiet time while they're getting surgery. And then the whole process sort of repeats. So in these quiet moments, sometimes my coworkers would do a crossword, read a magazine. And as long as we were quiet and on alert, we'd be able to jump up and go as soon as we were called. We were allowed to sort of entertain ourselves. And one day, I'd been thinking about this for a while because there's this whiteboard that would always get the date written at the top of it. And otherwise it was just kept like totally blank and sterile. And after a while, I just started in these wait times, these little quiet periods, doing a daily doodle. And I talked to the staff who were there or the patients who happened to be in the block room at that moment. I said, I'm going to draw something on the whiteboard. What, what, what would you like to see today? What's your favorite animal? Oh, I love cats. Let's do a city. And I just sort of have that as a little fun interaction, entertaining myself, but also just providing a little bit of life in the space. That's how it felt. And after some time of doing this, I remember my boss storming in and saying, who's been scribbling on the whiteboards? Whoever it is, everybody sort of like turns and looks at me. Well, whoever's doing that needs to stop right now because it's completely unprofessional. So I stopped. And that was the moment when I thought, well, a place like this is really not a place for a person like me. So I shut out, I, you know, I was quiet. I sat down. I shut out the me part of me when I went to work and I just did my job like this. And so let's jump forward to 2020. I saw a poster that was for an online presentation about an artist who had done a residency at a hospital, St. Vincent, here in Ottawa. And I thought, well, I have a connection to both those things. I'm really curious. I'll sign up. And that was the very first salon in the cloud with real links. And like CJ, who is the artist in residence, she's here today. It just blew my mind because here was a person who had been invited in to a hospital setting explicitly for the purpose of thinking outside of the box, witnessing, observing, developing relationships and humanizing the space through collaborative, creative means. I really love, I borrowed this slide from her presentation. Here you see some staff and some of her patient collaborators working on a mural that they did. And she said, key collaborator, Molly. Molly was a patient, but CJ didn't call her a patient. She recognized Molly as an artist and made an effort to acknowledge that first. And CJ apparently got a really good feedback on this mural and people would say, great job, CJ. And CJ said, well, I started it, but it was the patients who filled it in. And it was the patients who decided what it would look like. So not only was she in there and being creative and you know, enhancing the beauty of the space and making things interesting, but she was really doing it in a way that was so people-centered. They did a study on the impact of CJ's residency. I'll talk a little bit more about it later, but here's a quote that really stood out to me from that. It's from one of the participants who said, CJ was the only person I had intellectual conversations with, and that is a very important part of my being and sense of being. These conversations were nourishing. They made me remember who I am. I'm not my disease. I'm not my disability. I am more than that. 
And that just really stuck with me. I said, I got to talk to this person. I have to find out who this CJ is because it just was so powerful. And in her talk, she also talked about, you know, the work of Cat Holmes, looking at disability, not as an individual problem, as a personal health condition, but actually as a mismatch between people and the world around them. And she was using her art to help bridge that mismatch. At the end of her talk, one thing, well, one thing that had come out when she was in doing residency was that families and patients had remarked on how dull some of the art at St. Vincent Hospital was and how it really wasn't doing much for them. So she put a call out at the end of her presentation, seeking an emerging interdisciplinary social practice artist to help build an innovative and inclusive approach to curation, addressing medicalized spaces as vessels for quality art, active imagination, and user agency. So that was pretty cool. And I emailed her and we talked the next day for a long time and it's just been rolling ever since then. But that's a lot of words. I'm going to break it down a little bit in terms of what she meant. I think the main thing was just thinking about the issue of the art in the space not serving the people there. Why not use similar social practice approaches, inclusive approaches that are collaborating with families and patients, especially patients who very like often don't have a lot of voice in those settings, who often get talked about about their care, but not, you know, collaborated with. Why not take those approaches and start looking at the art in the space? And here's, here's a problem about art in hospitals and in other medical settings, and it's not just those spaces too. There are other spaces that have this problem, which is something I like to call imposed aesthetics. Every space that you go into has a vibe. There's certain colors on the walls, there's sunlight, or maybe there's no sunlight, the way that objects are arranged, the things that are in the space, all make an impact on the mood and our experience of that space. And the average person, like I can just go to a place, maybe it's a library, maybe it's a subway station. I get my feelings about those spaces. Maybe I go to a building, like I'm going to get my license renewed and oh, I have to go to that building. But at the end of the day, I can just go. When I'm done my task there, I come home, I come to this space where I'm very comfortable, I'm surrounded by objects that have meaning to me, photos of my family, my plants, and I've taken control and, you know, designed my own environment. And people do this with their desks and their lockers too. But when you're maybe a person who's incarcerated, you might not have that same amount of control. And the same goes for folks who are, for example, in long-term care. Maybe there's little ways you can personalize, but not to the extent that many of us have. Uh, I liken it a little bit to being sort of like stuck on hold when you're waiting for something on the phone and they're just playing that awful hold music on a loop. Maybe it's great to have music. Music is lovely. But when you're stressed and you need something and you're being forced to listen to the same few minutes of music over and over, that can actually increase your stress. You can get like you know, bad saxophone trauma from having to wait on customer service for too long, little tea trauma. Another experience of mine I had, I was going to my general practitioner for a routine pap test. And that's like kind of a vulnerable procedure. I was on the examination table with my legs up in the stirrup, sitting on the paper towel like a chicken. And someone in the clinic had put this cardboard cutout of a baby on the ceiling that said, no problem. And I thought, this sucks. This is a terrible decision. I don't want to look at this baby. First of all, and you know, when you're lying there, you don't have much of a choice. And I thought, what about people for whom these kinds of procedures are extraordinarily stressful? People who have had experiences, fears around cancer, fertility issues, and they have to look at a baby, say no problem. You know what? Maybe there is a problem. So it felt very insensitive. And you know, people think, oh, art is great, music is great, and it is, but it's not always helpful. It can be unhelpful too. Another example is I had a friend, when we were teenagers, she had to spend quite a bit of time in rehabilitation, and she had this room with this poster of a clown that she hated, and she had to get family friends to come cover it up so she didn't have to look at it all the time. Art historian Mary Hunter talks about this in her experience when her mother was receiving treatment for cancer. She said when they went into the foyers, the grand entrances, there was some really beautiful striking artwork. Obviously resources had been put there and they made a really good impression. But on the actual ward where her mother was, a lot of the artwork had been donated. Donated in memory. 
of people who had been treated there. And so the subject matter was chosen by people who were in mourning. And that really showed through in some of the pieces. There was an image of a little boy with the ghost of his grandfather. There was a painting with empty deck chairs by a lake, by a cottage. It said the last visit. So for Mary and her mother, they couldn't even go down that hallway. And yet it was just there. So even well-intentioned choices can sometimes have a mismatch between, you know, what people think, you know, art is going to be helping here versus the actual experience of people being stuck with it. But art doesn't have to be unhelpful. And I think if you really consciously choose things and you use research and use conversations and you have a process where you're really involving staff and families and patients in these environments, it can make a super positive impact. There is a term called placemaking. That's sort of a buzzword. You hear it a lot in design. And it's the idea that every building you go into is a space. So what makes a space a place is the stories that happen inside of it, the interactions, the feelings, the memories. And you can help foster these positive experiences and certain kinds of interactions and behaviors by making choices about how the space is built, what's in that space, where is there seating, where is there sunlight, is there going to be a public art piece? All these things can help make the space into a place. In hospitals, you have to consider, it's a tricky balance. You're not going to please everyone when you're making these spaces into places. Alexandra Kirsch, who's the curator at the Royal Victoria Hospital in Montreal, says that there's this universal experience in a hospital that many of us can relate to. That's hurry up, hurry up, and then you wait. And then you hurry and you wait. And that's just how the system works. But when you're catering to patients and visitors, you have to keep in mind the spectrum of emotion that goes between fear and stress, sort of this psychological overstimulation. And on the other end of it is boredom, understimulation. So some folks, if you're really, really stressed, maybe you want something that's going to soothe you. Images of nature, waterfalls. And early on in the research on art in hospitals, they found a lot of excellent evidence for this, especially also gardens. We know a lot about the healing power of gardens. But what about when you're bored? You want something to distract yourself, to be interested, something that you can read or think about that's not the problem that you're really worried about. So that's something to consider as well. And curating can be a sort of extended form of healthcare. If you look back at the definition of curation, it comes from this idea of curing disease or restoring to health. So the traditional curator was going to be collecting and of course taking care of objects. And we might, you know, the image might come to mind of some white dude who's collected objects from around the world and put it in an ivory tower institution where the rich can go and feel cultured and special. And it's very elitist and exclusive, but luckily, museums and galleries and sort of the whole art world is starting to get that there's also value in expanding out into the general public. And I would love, and there's more participatory community-based approaches working with people in different communities. I would love to see more of this happening, this idea of community in the art world for them to expand their thinking into thinking about medical spaces as also being community spaces and places where cultural appreciation and production should be happening as well. Uh, there has been art in hospitals for a long time in the Western world. In the medieval times when medicine was not necessarily as effective, we didn't have the same tools and techniques and understandings, they couldn't necessarily do a lot to help a sick person. They could maybe leech them or bleed them and they could pray and just hope for the best. So. There was the incorporation of religious iconography and also an understanding of something that they could do was at least create an environment that was going to be relaxing and foster healing. So even there is, I heard stories about historical hospitals in Europe having works of the great masters such as Rembrandt in them. But as medicine advanced, we started understanding germ theory, the human body and medicine became modern medicine as we know it now. That understanding of the importance of environment fell by the wayside and there was this very reductionist mentality of a person being a body and body parts to heal. And that's how we got to where we are now. That's how we developed our understanding. But luckily, I think with the advancements of tools and technologies 
that we have now, we've gotten to a point where people have sort of the brain space and perspective to start thinking about environment again. And there's a growing trend of something called healing architecture, which is all about this. Art can have a lot of functions in medical settings. The mere presence of art has been shown to increase feelings of patient safety, socialization opportunities, connectedness to the outside world, and a sense of identity. So it can be soothing in that waterfall example I mentioned. It can provide cognitive and emotional stimulation, distractions, wayfinding like that hand, connecting, starting conversations. So being able to go and look at something and chat with someone that's not about being sick or how scared you are. Also a sense of belonging, identity. So maybe you, you're in the hospital and you have that Johnny coat on and you're a patient, but you see a landscape that's a childhood scene for you or you see someone wearing regalia from your culture, and suddenly there's that reminder, like, I am more than this. Another thing that art in hospitals can be really good for is not everybody necessarily goes to the art gallery. Again, that's getting better, but culturally speaking, that's not something that everybody has the opportunity to do, but everybody has to go to a hospital at one point or the other. So if you're putting high quality art in these settings, it's an opportunity to actually reach a lot more people. I'm going to talk about a few examples of art and hospitals that I learned about during my research. Two are local projects from my hometown, Edmonton, as well as one international example, Chelsea and Westminster. I also just wanted to put a caveat here that art is used in medicine. It is used in healthcare settings through a number of, in a number of professions in art therapy, occupational therapy, recreational therapy as a sort of therapeutic tool. And that's really great. And, but for today, I'm going to be focusing more broadly on art and artists in the environment. Friends of the University of Alberta Hospital has been around for 30 years, and they have a really robust program, including a gallery in the hospital where they bring in art from the outside world, really juried quality shows, as well as artists on the ward. So some of you heard music at, before this presentation happened. That was a harp player who has been with them a long time who will go to bedside and play music. So they have poets, musicians, visual artists. And they also have, they manage a giant collection of works that are taken care of by a professional curator and have been really carefully considered for the people in that space. They did a study a few years ago on the impact of the collection, what they could do better, what was working well. And there were some really interesting insights that came from that. The top left here, we have a piece by Indigenous artist Erin Paquette called Mother Earth Gives Us the Seasons. People really love that piece because not only does it have that cultural, like that cultural link, but you'd walk along the hall and there would be this series of work that had a logical connection that told a story with different imageries about the seasons. On the right hand side, there's a piece, there's a patient looking at a piece, I have a better picture. It's called Walter always feels a sense of freedom when he wears his hospital gown. And it's this guy booking it with his little butt hanging out figurine. And so using humor. On the bottom left, Ellen Cunningham, who's the curator there, said that this is an example, it's work by Christina Kudrick. She said it was an example of art that's abstract, working really well and being very well received by people in the hospital. And she attributes that to its placement on a very large wall that's well lit, the colors, and also the fact that it's not just abstract. When you look at the paintings, there are hints of representation, little beehives, dragonflies. So it's the kind of piece that you'd actually be able to come back to time and time again and maybe see different things every time. This is just a quote, and I don't know if it's completely word for word because I heard it via Ellen, but one of the artists on the ward who's a poet talks about how medical staff help the patients by identifying what's wrong with them. But when you get artists in that space, they have space and opportunity to help remember what's right with them and who they are beyond the hospital walls. Chelsea and Westminster Hospital in London, UK, is I would say a real leader in research and developments on healing and art in hospitals. They've looked into VR, their ICU is specially designed with lighting and sound in mind, and they've had some really innovative approaches. And they're also like taking, they're doing research and they're getting data on how this is actually helping staff morale and patient outcomes. One project that really stood out to me 
was their moving animal portrait project in pediatrics. The artistic director, Tristan Hawkins, went and he observed Peds emergency and he started talking to kids there, which is really key. Because here's that co-curation element, actually consulting with the people who are there and being affected rather than just coming and making a decision yourself. And he said, what would you like to see here? And apparently a new Harry Potter movie had just come out and some of the kids said, gee, wouldn't it be cool if we could have moving paintings just like in Harry Potter? And shortly after that, he was observing a young child getting blood drawn. And in order to distract the child, there was a nurse who was playing a YouTube video of a hamster to this kid. So Tristan kind of put those things together and he said, why don't we try a project where we're going to use, you know, moving paintings as possible with flat screen TVs. So they commissioned a series of animal portraits where the animals would move a little bit on a loop. It was a little bit engaging, but not super, you know, it wasn't jarring either. And what they found was an 87% reduction in reported pain from kids who were in the rooms with the paintings versus rooms with no moving paintings when they were getting their blood drawn. So that's huge. But pediatrics is a super easy sell. There's this inherent understanding, like everybody loves kids, they're super cute, and everyone knows that when a kid is scared or something stressful is happening, they should have comfort, they should have enrichment, they should have beauty, color, stimulation. So normally if you go to a kid's clinic or a kid's hospital, there'll be art there. Like people get that and there's money in that. But unfortunately, that's not always the case for all populations. And that reflects how society views certain groups of people. For example, everybody likes to, you know, invest in beauty and the environment for kids. But what about folks who are in long-term care? Or populations who are stigmatized, such as patients who are receiving care for psychiatric issues. And this brings me to my next example. This is a smaller, much smaller scale. It's just a single project rather than a big program like the other two. But this is the Grey Nuns Hospital Psychiatry Art Project. And I had the opportunity to interview Jan Benash, who was the former site chief of psychiatry and who spearheaded this whole project. It all started with these terrible, terrible pink walls that she hated. And it wasn't just her, other people complained about them too. And apparently every single other wall in the entire hospital had been repainted, except for the psych department, still had the original pink that had been chosen in the 1980s. And this is just an example of how our societal biases do trickle down and like have an effect on decisions that are made in these spaces and policy that's made and what we prioritize or don't prioritize. And she said, you know, if the mission statement of government health is the compassionate care of the mentally ill, why aren't we addressing it in our living environment? And so she started asking about this. She started advocating to get the walls repainted. And she said she had to play administration for the better part of a year. It got to the point that there was one administrator apparently who would run around the corner when she saw Dr. Banash because she knew that Dr. Banash was gonna say, when is this gonna happen? When are we going to repaint? And finally, after this whole process, this whole one year back and forth, they repainted the walls white. And once they were white, she said, gee, this is lovely. Wouldn't it be great if we put art up on these walls? And that's how the art rehang started. So she partnered up with an organization called the Art Mentorship Society of Alberta, which is a collective of artists who have lived experience with mental illness, many of whom actually had received treatment or gone through outpatient programs at the Grey Nuns itself. And she organized for staff to go and select work by these artists, which they then paid, you know, they bought at full price and got professionally framed and put it up on the walls, completely transforming the space. Here are some examples of the artists with their work. I was one of the artists whose pieces was purchased and it was so exciting. It was the first time my art had been in a permanent collection. And I think there was similar excitement for many of my colleagues in the organization. Bottom left is Sean Zinnick with a beautiful painting of a tree. And then on the top left, we have Kim Fur who's showing off some boot paintings in a portfolio. And I think that background that you see, that pink is the pink that Jen was talking about. There was some fear from administration that if you got art from, from people who experience mental illness and put it in a psychiatric ward, that would be too edgy, too upsetting, too triggering for patients. It might set them off. But what they found was that some of these images, even if they were a little bit more difficult, like this painting Myself in Blue by Anita, there was therapeutic value in it because some patients felt empathized with. 
they felt seen and there was something they could point to to help maybe describe how they were feeling in times when words just really don't do the trick. This hasn't been formally studied, but I would really, really love to see some official research done onto this project, just because all the stories that I heard through interviewing people were so powerful. And even beyond the patient experience, even there were people like maintenance staff who got super into helping paint the paintings and decide where they went. And there was this sense of connection and meaning there. There hasn't been a lot of specific research into co-curation and health, but I'm gonna just talk briefly about a couple studies that are sort of related. This one is about aesthetic value of paintings affecting the people's experience of pain. So what these researchers did is they got their participants to look at a series of paintings and rate them as beautiful, ugly, or neutral. And so each one of these was the person's own choice to say, this is a beautiful one, this is an ugly one. It varied from person to person. And then they showed them things or they showed them nothing as a baseline and they zapped them in the hand. <laughs> and what they found is when people were getting their zaps and they were looking at a painting that they had identified as beautiful, their experience of pain was less compared to when they were looking at things they had identified as ugly or the baseline of nothing at all. Uh, there was a great study out of Denmark on how patients experience and use art in hospitals. They took a number of pieces from the Danish Art Museum and got patients to rank them, again, based on their personal preferences. And people were more comfortable, they felt more social, and a stronger sense of identity when surrounded by their personally higher-ranked art. The last study I was going to mention was this official study that was done on CJ's residency at St. Vincent. And one thing they mentioned in that study was when there was public display of the patient's own work, like those murals, for example, that helped support a sense of meaning, purpose, and pride for the patients. They got to go tell the staff about it, family members, oh, did you know I did this mural? Let's take a look. They could talk about the choices, the experience. And so that was really meaningful compared to just sort of a random hotel poster that's been there for 50 years. The one thing I would caution about this is that we don't only show art therapy art or patient art because that closes the chain of the hospital and makes it insular. Whereas we can, I think, help, like I said, connect people with the outside world, which is a very valuable too. So I think there is a balance to be found between the two. The University of Michigan has a really awesome, simple program they've figured out. Now they have a bunch of things, sort of like this University of Alberta, they have a, a big collection, they have artists on the residence, artists in residence, and they have bedside musicians. But one of their programs that really stood out to me was this art cart program. And they figured out, they specially designed these carts, it's volunteer run, and they have this library of posters that are framed in such a way that you can easily wipe them down so you're not spreading around bugs through the art. And then the volunteers will go to the bedside and give the patients a range of options saying, do you want any of these by your bed? And they can easily switch them out. So these people are not stuck with the clown poster, luckily. They're able to have at least that tiny, tiny bit of say of look, something in their environment that they can look at that was their choice. So some of the popular items were images of nature, images of from famous works from museums they've had, and also think items of local significance. So for example, posters of the college sports team. A lot of people choose that. And this is a reason why we need to talk to patients, and this is patient-driven, because I am not into sports, and I would never in a million years say, you know what we should put up is like the football team. But my preferences don't matter here. It's about the patient, and if they want the picture of the football team, and that's going to be meaningful for them, then that's wonderful. And what they've been able to do with this art cart program, in addition to getting it up and running, is they have all this data about what people like and don't like. Yes. because they keep records of everything that's loaned, how long it's loaned for, and they can use this information when they acquire future posters. So it's kind of iterative, and I'd like to imagine it's, in, you know, it's informed by the kind of the current day public rather than being stuck in the past. And this is some, something I also really appreciated about that, about, that, about that study that university, that was done at the University of Alberta Hospital as well, is they could take these focus groups and take the feedback and integrate that knowledge into their curatorial practices. But there are some big challenges with co-curation too. One of them is this is, it's happening here and there, but it's not, it's starting to grow, but there's nothing hugely centralized yet. 
And it's a new kind of intervention for a lot of spaces. There are some leaders, but there are a lot of smaller facilities that really haven't put resources into this or they maybe are not able to. And our system is already strained. We don't want to compete with the need for nurses to be paid better. We need another social worker. There's going to be a life-saving device for this thing. We can't compete with taxpayer healthcare dollars. That needs to go to saving lives and really like the medical side of things. So all the programs like Grey Nun's art project was funded by staff, and that was just a passion project of Dr. Banash. And you, like the Friends of the University of Hospital, is run by a nonprofit or a charity where they get corporate and public donations. It's all fundraised separately. So it is an issue trying to get the resources so that you can start implementing these things and also research them, learn about the effects, and disseminate that so that we can refine the approach and hopefully spread what we're doing. Another thing is communication and consent. We can't always know, like one thing that's going to work for one person is going to be terrible for another. And that's always a giant challenge. And I think this becomes more challenging when you're working with populations that maybe struggle communicating verbally, for example, should they not be part of this conversation just because they can't easily talk, but then how do you get that information? And there are some efforts being made, like University of Alberta has this interdisciplinary project where they're looking at soundscapes in the ICU and using artificial intelligence to narrow down and refine soundscapes that are personalized to an individual based on the biofeedback that they're recording when the people are hearing the soundscapes. But again, there are some big challenges in terms of consent there. And I'd be very curious. I think it's early days for them. So I'm going to definitely be following it and seeing how they navigate some of those challenges. Another challenge is the long-term sustainability. So a lot of hospitals, when they get built or renovated, there's, it's mandated that there's a certain percentage of the budget, a small percentage will go into art for the space. Often it's 1%. And most of the time what happens is they hire in an interior decor person, or maybe they contract in a curator and the art gets put up on the walls and then they get helicoptered in, you know, and then they just leave and it's just left on its own devices. But the people who are in the hospital in 1985 are not the same people in the hospital in 22, right? Like sensibilities change. Maybe the populations that they're serving change. So if we want to co-curate and really take into consideration the people who are in those spaces, it needs to be dialogical and it needs to be iterative. It needs to be ongoing. So how do we get people to understand that this isn't something that you just dump and go? 10 minutes. Great, thank you. I'm going to be at St. Vincent Hospital starting this summer to do a pilot research project on some co-curation approaches. And CJ with her residency has laid a lot of really awesome groundwork. I know I talked about University of Michigan's art cart and CJ, when she was artist in residence or afterwards, she developed something for Culture Days that was called Art Tour for Bedside Art Fans. So for patients at St. Vincent who were not mobile, who were not able to just go around and see the work that she had made with patients and the changes that she'd made in the environment through her collaborative art, they used iPads that the hospital had anyway. And people were able to, from bed, digitally go around the hospital and see the art. So I'd be very curious if we can sort of piggyback or expand on that effort, taking into consideration not just the people as they're going through space, but how if people are in one single space, how you can still grant access and accessibility, even something as simple as where a painting is hanging. Is it in the sight line of someone in a wheelchair? Like these are things that need to be thought about and assessed. I'm going to leave us today with some calls to action. I think on a local level, something that would be really cool, I've, there's been words going around, there's quite a few people who are beginning to retire who might have been art collectors and maybe they're moving into a condo and they have art that they don't want to just go to waste. I think there's a lot of potential for donations of quality art, even in Ottawa at St. Vincent to replace some of the art that was described in the study as, as drab or dull. But we need to make sure that people aren't just also treating the hospital as a sort of goodwill or a place they can just dump stuff that they don't want. 
we need to take it back to the patients, the staff, the people who are there, and make sure that the acquisitions that do happen are going to be valuable and meaningful. So I think, I don't know if it would be a website or some kind of form back and forth process, but I would love to develop something along those lines. Another thing that needs to be done is fostering relationships with allies for art who already have a voice in medical communities and healthcare settings. So this could be site chiefs, CEOs, you know, admin, leaders, teachers. A lot of the projects I talked about today, CJ's residency was spearheaded. It was championed by Dr. Carol Weeb, who used to be VP of External Affairs at Briere and said, we should get an artist in here. And before she, her doctor times, before she became a doctor, she actually was a professionally trained musician and did music and performed. So that's someone who just really gets art and gets the power of it, who was within the system saying, let's make something happen. Let's bring that in here. Dr. Jan Banash out of psychiatry, it was a similar thing. Because she was site chief, she had a little bit more of a voice to advocate for repainting and then getting the paintings up in the wall versus like a patient who's just stuck there saying this clown sucks. I would love to do something like get some lecture series, even to medical students, for example, folks who are in training for healthcare positions in public health, get them while they're young <laughs> to start thinking about these kinds of things, but not just build, building connections with people in healthcare, but also on a broader scale, folks in politics, building connections with parliamentarians to spread this message and disseminate within parliament and the broader public, because they really have, they have a voice. And one example of a person who's been doing awesome work is Senator Patricia Bovey. She was a former art director who was instrumental in the creation of a hospital art gallery at St. Boniface Hospital in Winnipeg. And since she's become a senator, she's done projects amplifying the voices of Black artists, advocating for Indigenous artists, as well as art and hospitals. So she's been talking a lot about this. She's done great work. And if we could develop more relationships with people like that and help support them and share what they're doing, and that would be really helpful, I think, promoting this kind of and supporting these kinds of initiatives. But it's not just hospital people. It's not just parliamentarians. There needs to be some understanding and appreciation and value of, of this in terms of the broader public as well. Tristan Hawkins, who's the artistic director at Chelsea Westminster in London said, you know, making a case in the public eye is crucial to raising the funds that they use for their research and for their art in the hospital program. The last thing is this is not a one person job. I can't just go and do it. CJ couldn't just go in and do this on her own. It has to be in conversation that's happening throughout networks across disciplines in healthcare, as well as the art world. And we have to make sure as well that the folks who often don't have voices in these kinds of situations, for example, the patients, people in long-term care, we need to make sure that they're reached people who have disabilities, we need to make sure that their voices are part of a conversation too. And that takes an effort, but that's an effort that's really worth making. There's this nothing about us without us. And I think this really needs to be um, applied here in terms of co-curation, because otherwise there wouldn't be the co in the practice. So thank you everyone for coming to this today. And I just want to give a shout out to CJ because I have honestly learned so, so much from you and I've been so inspired by your work and I'm really excited to move, like go from the foundation that you've built at St. Vincent. And to everyone who I interviewed when I was doing this research, who told me your stories, thank you very much. If you have any ideas or questions, you ever want to sit down on Zoom or have a coffee, and discuss this stuff more, feel free to contact me. I wrote my email down on the bottom left, and we're also going to send out a resource sheet after this, along with the recording. So my contact information will be there as well. And that's it.